Well, good morning. Uh, everybody doing okay? Yeah, I mean, come on. Uh, uh, yeah. I'm going to elect one of you guys sometime to come up here and ask that question and then stand and watch your response. One of looks at you like, no, I'm not doing okay. Leave me alone. Um, well, you're in the right place, okay? At least you're in the right place. Uh, and so we're excited about that. Glad you're here. First, I want to say to those of you who are mothers, happy Mother's Day. We're glad that you're here. We're, we're thankful that you're eating platform. Husbands, Tim, if you didn't clap for your wife, you're in trouble later. You're going to be cooking lunch, right? That's what I thought. <laughs> me, me too. Um, yeah, happy Mother's Day. It's, uh, it's cool to have uh, moms here with us today. And I, my mom, I haven't called her yet today. Um, my mom is, I've, you, you know a little bit about her, but my mom's um, 88, 88. Uh, my mom still works full time. Um, but I have to call her later. She'll be all excited when all her, when her kids call and her grandkids call. But anyway, uh, I, I thought about Mother's Day and I thought, how, how does this fit, okay? Um, and I, the more I thought about how can I fit the idea of mothers into this series of imperfect disciples. And you'll hear it a little bit throughout. I'll give examples and you'll hear some of that. But we're in our second, <clears throat> our second series of Imperfect Disciples. We're in Mark chapter 9, verse 33 through 35. Three verses. That's all I'm going to speak on today. Three verses. Um, and it's pretty, uh, it has a lot in here. And, and what's in here, uh, Jesus uh, was talking to the disciples. But the principle that he was talking about doesn't just apply to the Gospels. It's an overarching principle that we see in Scripture, Old Testament, Gospels, New Testament, Paul's, Pauline, the, Paul's epistles. And so I want, you to, I, I want you to remember that. This isn't isolated. This isn't an, an isolated thing as we talk about imperfect disciples. But let, let's jump right in. Um, Brittany, thanks for praying. Thank you. Um, Mark chapter 9, verse 33 through 35. And uh, read with me if you will. By the way, we have an app, uh, Arrives, Arrives app. You can log in in the notes. There's a lot of notes in there. You can follow along in your Bible. Um, however, because I'm a little old fashioned, there's nothing wrong with having one of these. Amen. All right. But I'm going to read it up here because it's bigger. I, I can see it. Um, Mark, Mark chapter 9, verse 33 through 35, uh, and it says this. So after they arrived at Capernaum and settled in a house, Jesus asked his disciples, what were you discussing out on the road? But they didn't answer because they had been arguing about which one of them was the greatest. Verse 35, he sat down, the he is Jesus called the disciples over to him, called the 12 disciples over to him and said, whoever wants to be, be first must take last place and be servant of everyone else. True to Jesus' form, he, he doesn't play into what they were arguing about. They were arguing about who's going who's, who's to be first in the kingdom of God? Who's going to be first now? Um, and Jesus says, okay. Um, whoever wants to be first must take last place. He didn't say, so guys, sit down, you 12 sit down, and I'm going to number you as in order of how important you are. Like, okay, Peter, you're first. No, Matthew, maybe. I mean, he didn't do that, okay? But he used this illustration, and he, and he addressed it without addressing it. True to Jesus' form. You know, he just gives it to us. And so um, it, it's pretty interesting about how, how this works. But uh, I have a video for you. I don't want to show it just yet. But I just want to read an intro that I wrote down. And now there's two parts to this, two parts to this uh, Imperfect Disciples um, story and what, what, we're, what I want you to focus on today. One is... One is, they were comparing themselves with one another. 
That's what they were doing. I'm first. No, I'm first. <laughs> I'm first. That's, what, that's one of the things they're doing. The second thing that we're, I want to talk about is what Jesus says. If you want to be first, you got to be last. Um, and so I want to talk about those two principles as it relates to imperfect disciples that we are. But let me read this and then I'll let you watch the video. Everywhere we turn, there are things that we don't have. Cars, trucks, a nice 18-foot bass boat with sparkles. Okay, and stuff. <laughs> Images that we see make us desire the things that we don't have. And this is a culprit right here. And the TV, right? The television. Then there are people that we see that we would like to look like or be like. Hair color, age, personality, talents, relationships that they have that you don't. Many things. In the ultimate end, we slip into comparing ourselves with those we wish we were like, or with those that we wish we had what they had, because somehow that's going to change who you are. I'm, I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Then there's this: in a world we live in, the world we live in, we are in a crowded society, but. We live shoulder to shoulder every day. However, we're distant from each other. Uh, this happened to me this morning while I was getting my third or fourth coffee. I don't remember. I was at the gas station getting some coffee. and uh, We're lonely. We're surrounded by people. We're in a crowded room and we're lonely. And we find ourselves depressed and not understanding why we are where we are and what we are. We are more excited to wake up and realize, ooh, I have a notification. I have a wave. And somehow that brings some relief to our minds thinking, ooh, at least they like me. At least they responded. You don't have to raise your hands because I already know. We all, that's, that's a thing. It brings some relief. And we've replaced the over the fence conversation, face to face, holding the door, a friendly, good morning, how are you? Good to see you with a grunt, a nod, your head goes down, I got things to do, I got to do my thing. I, listen, I've done that. So this morning I was at the gas station and um, uh, this, I just did this this morning, okay, I'm being transparent. I'm speaking about this and I caught myself doing it. That, it that's the worst, you know. I went into the, the Shell station right at 127 across from Starbucks, I went in there, Got some gas, grabbed a coffee. This gentleman held the door for me. I walked in, did not even say thank you. I, 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 now, whether my mind was on it or not, it's still not okay. And so he followed me in and I could tell, I could feel his eyes. <laughs> I could feel his eyes looking at me. I'm like standing in line like, is he gonna jump me from the back or what? Like what's, come, what's happening? But we slip into that. I slip into that. Man, I got things to do. Instead of stopping for a second, we trade. Instead of caring about somebody else and serving somebody else, we trade that for, I'm going to help myself. I'm not going to help you. And Jesus talks about this uh, differently. So I watched this fellow online. His name's Simon Sinek. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He does TED Talks, he does, has a podcast, he's a leadership guru. Um, I don't know if he's a believer or not. Um, you can judge by 
uh, this video, but this, I watched this uh, about a week ago and I thought this is perfect because it's a great example of what we're going to be talking about. So if you guys would go ahead and show the video. Look, human beings, we can't help ourselves but compare ourselves to others. And uh, comparison is, is the deadliest thing we can do to ourselves because we will always come up short. And right. we'll, it'll, all it does is exaggerate all of our insecurities. Um, it's okay to enjoy other people's success, but you, you let them live their lives and mm -hmm. you live your life. Oh, and by the way, they're curating their social media. That's not really their life. <laughs> Um, and so you're making decisions based on how you feel, based on their curated p things. I know, I've talked to so many millennials, I know somebody who's out of work, really depressed, and yet she goes and does all these things so she has the appearance of this amazing successful life. And, and so you met, now she may be making those decisions based on what her friends, oh, who knows what sort of weird, twisted, exaggerated, you know, circle of, of, of depression this is forming. Mm -hmm. So go back to the rules of the infinite game. Your friends are there to admire. Your friends are there to say, God, that I'm so happy for them. What are they doing that I can learn from? Uh, I'll give you an example. So we're all, so we can all fall into this trap. So you know, in my business, uh, authors and speakers and folks like us, we're all comparing ourselves to each other. And sometimes it can get silly and competitive. And there was, you know, sometimes I go on Amazon and check the rankings of my books to see that, there's, <laughs> that I still have a job. And, and now and then, there was this one author mm -hmm who I hated for no reason. <laughs> He's very smart. His work's incredibly good. He's incredibly well respected. I respect him, but I hate him. <laughs> and I would check the rankings of his books. And when I was ahead, I'd be like, yes. <laughs> and when he was ahead, I was like, <laughs> right? It would drive me crazy. And I had this weird abstract competition. Mm -hmm. Same thing, right? Social media happened to be Amazon rankings. Right. And I would check in all the time. I'd always check in, mine, his, mine, his, nobody else, just mine and his. <laughs> anyway, we were, uh, I, sh I was at an event and we were interviewed together on the same stage. Mm -hmm. And the interviewer decided to let us in introduce each other. <laughs> so I went first. <laughs> I had to introduce him. And this is what I said. I looked at him and I said, uh, you make me very insecure. <laughs> I said, uh, because all of your strengths are all of my weaknesses. And every time I see you do well, it just reminds me what I'm bad at. That's how I opened up. <laughs> he, he turned to me and he said, funny, I feel the same way about you. <laughs> and now we love each other. <laughs> because I realized that he's really good at what I'm bad at, so by me getting to know him and really learning to love him, I'm realizing I'm getting better at those things. And I'm taking more pride in the things that I'm good at rather, think, rather than thinking I have to be good at everything he's good at. Right? So that, that it's, it's healthy to grow our own strengths and mm -hmm. rather than be intimidated by the strengths of others. When I watched that, I thought, oof, eek, right? Um, whether you want to admit it or not, and you may, you may be sitting here today and you may be thinking in your mind, I never do that. I could probably talk with you for 15 minutes and get something out of you, I'm sure of it. Like we all slip into that, at whatever level of comparing ourselves, and there's, there's some deadly things, like Simon was saying, like it's the worst thing you could do. The disciples did the worst thing. They were comparing themselves in order to see who was first in the kingdom. So let's read Mark chapter 9, verse 33 and 34. So I'm going to break it up into two pieces, 33 and 34, and then I'll go to verse 35. After they arrived at Capernaum and settled in the house, Jesus asked his disciples, what were you discussing out on the road? But they didn't answer. Because they had been arguing about which one of them was the greatest. No one is going to stand up here, or anywhere for that matter, and say, let me pick somebody. Um, Brent, you knew it was coming, didn't you? Yeah. I see Brent and I'm like, man, I really like his truck. It's nice. Or is it your wife's? 
It, okay, no comment. Smart, it's Mother's Day. Now, that's not necessarily bad. Oh, I like that truck. Man, maybe I could have something that, one day like that. If it turns and I begin to compare myself to Brent, he has a truck that's nicer than mine, therefore, Brent must be doing better than I am and he's better than me, therefore, I need that truck, right? Is it running good? Just wanna make sure I'm getting the right truck, okay? You, you see what I'm saying? Like, viewing things and seeing somebody and, oh, that's cool, man, I'd love to have one of those, that's different. We're talking about comparing to the degree and it leads to you trying to match up or meet up with the person that's in your view. You, you've heard of it and you've seen it, Keeping Up With The Johnsons, right? It's a movie, um, but it's the real thing. Neighbors uh, in our neighborhood, it's very interesting. Some of you know where I live. I will not give my address out, no. Um, you drive in our neighborhood and you go up the street and there's four houses on the right hand side in our neighborhood. And they have lawn wars. You know what I'm talking about? On Saturday morning, this is no lie, on Saturday morning, every single one of them, one has a John Deere, one has a Gravely, one, four different kinds of mowers, and all of them are out there making sure their lines are. I can see them like. And they're competing. I mean, their lawns look great, right? Nothing wrong with a great looking lawn. But what happens is you get consumed with that. Funny, in this, in this narrative here, Jesus says to them, what were you discussing on the road? Now, first of all, Jesus already knew what they were discussing. Like, it's not like he didn't know. He knew that they were discussing who's going to be first. Look at verse 34, but they didn't answer. Who's going to admit that they were comparing themselves with somebody else and it overtook them and they actually got in an argument because they feel like they're the best and they're comparing themselves to one another. No one's going to admit that, maybe. Certainly not these disciples, but Jesus knew. Uh, this is so, oh, so how he is, right? But they didn't answer because... Here's the reason. They have been arguing about which one of them is the greatest. This is what it reminds me of. It reminds me of a elementary playground fight. Right? My dad can beat up your dad. My dad has a better job than your dad. Well, my dad has a bigger truck than your dad. You know how little kids do. They come out with these sharp things and then the third kid enters. My mom can beat up both of your dads. <laughs> and it's like he trumped the whole thing, right? It's like, come on, where did this guy come from, you know? And, and, and it, what the disciples were doing is nothing more than an elementary playground fight. And Jesus knew, and he could have said, listen, you guys, knock it off. Let me read something to you from Psalms 139, the fact about Jesus knowing. Oh, Lord, you have examined my heart and you know everything about me. You know when I sit down or stand up. Listen, you know my thoughts even when I'm far away. If you slip into this and you think you're escaping God, you're not. I'm not. He's got my number. He knows me. He hears me. But he's still gracious and loving. Don't get it sometimes. Don't get it. What I want to do is I want to talk to you about three things, <clears throat> three things that I believe, and I'm going to give you examples from the Bible, three things that I believe comparison does. Number one, comparison brings shame. Comparison brings shame. 
If you have to admit that you've compared yourself to one another or someone that's in your view and it has changed your thought process and your decision making, um, nobody's going to admit that. Yeah, I, you know, I know. T Can I use you, Tim Halstead? I know Tim has a nice bass boat. I'm not going to admit I wanted a bigger bass boat than him. I mean, I've never seen his boat yet till we go fishing. Um, like, who's going to stand up and admit that? This is shameful. Like, it's, and that's why the disciples, you know what they said? Nothing. Why did they say nothing? Because they were ashamed that they were actually comparing themselves to one another. Okay. Here's the mama part. You ready, moms? When you have your first child, do you remember that? You don't know what to do. You're scared to death. And you're looking around at all these moms who seem like they have it together. Right? When in reality, newsflash, they don't. But you begin to compare yourself with them, not in a bad way. I'm not talking about getting advice. I'm talking about, well, if I just did things this way, then my, I would be that kind of mom. If I just did things this way, I would be able to handle everything. Okay? Um, one of the pieces of advice I give to um, married couples, number one, but... Not, not, not as much as those who are having children. My piece of advice is this. Don't listen to anyone. Search the scripture. Ask God what you should do. Listen, as soon as you have a baby, everybody and their brother on Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, and you name it, has a piece of advice for you. And all of a sudden, you get overwhelmed, right, Mom? You, like, you're overwhelmed with it. I can't do it. And it begins to erode how you feel about yourself. You're already struggling. We won't even talk about postpartum. Come on. That's part of it. Like, how you think, and if you compare, it does things to your mind. As a new mom, you're not going to admit that. Why? Because it's shameful. You want to appear to has, have it all together. Trust me. Trust me. The second one is easier than the first one, and he'll be eating cookies off of the carpet by the time it's done. The first one? No. You know, you know how it is, right? New mom, right? Second one, third one, fourth one, they're feral. I mean, they just, you know, they're just going doing their own thing, you know? You learn and you grow. And listen, God can lead you. God can lead you. So that you don't compare yourself with somebody else. He wants you to be the mom that he wants you to be, not who that mom is. He's happy with you, mom. The way you're momming, okay, the way you're going about that, prayerfully and hopefully, he's pleased with you. Don't compare yourself to somebody else. Don't lower yourself to that level. Compare yourself to Jesus. What would Jesus do? Hey, don't suffer those little kids. Come up here and jump on my lap. You know how moms do, right? Comparisons many times bring shame. And it takes the focus off what God wants for you, and you put it on somebody else, and you're focused on them and what they're doing all the time. The disciples. Well, I'm going to be first. No, you're not. Well, I, I know that I'm going to be the, the cornerstone of the church. I'm, I'm Peter. Of course I would. Yeah. Well, we know Judas didn't say anything, right? You know, he probably didn't say anything. He probably just sat silent. But it brings shame when we do that. And you feel that inside. You don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. Philippians chapter 3, verses 18 and 19 says this. And the Apostle Paul speaks very clearly here. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of Christ. What? Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly and their glory is their shame with their minds set on earthly things. 
The glory of their shame is misplaced priorities on another person that you think if you were like, you would just be better. Let me just say this to you. You are already good enough in Jesus' eyes. That's it. You're already good enough. And I'll just put a plug in there. Please, don't compare yourself with the junk that you see on social media. It's not real. It's fabricated and curated, like Simon Sinek was saying. Number two, when you compare yourself with somebody else, oftentimes it leads to jealousy and resentment. Because you'll find soon enough that as you're trying to be that person that you're, that's in your view, you somehow just can't attain it. And you begin to get jealous of what they have and you begin to resent them because of it. Don't tell me it doesn't happen. It does. It does happen. We, get, we slip into this, and it happens in the church. Well, you have to have this. I, I, I love cars. I love trucks. And I see, um, you know, you see the commercials, you know. Uh, Chevy has, and some of you may have this. If you have it, I might idolize you, but we'll do, talk about that after the sermon. Um, it has a it has a bumper that, it, or the the rear hatch goes down, and then it breaks in half, and it's like a seat, and then a step flips out, and then and the Dodges. I was watching a commercial for a job. I'm like, man, I want one of those. It has coolers on both sides in the fender. Like, are you kidding me? I want that. If you have one of those, raise your hand. I'll come look at it afterwards so I can at least model you. I'm just kidding. But that's what we do. The practical stuff, right? We do it with the practical stuff. I do that. And I catch myself like, ah, I really don't need that. Or for me, like uh, some of you are mechanics. And some of you have really nice tools and toolboxes. Well, I happen to have a lot of toolboxes. But for some reason, if I see somebody that has a nicer one, I'm like, that ain't right. I should have that too. I have a lot of tools. And I think to myself, wait, 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 no. Now, my wife is in childcare, so she can't hear any of this. So this is a good thing. Um, I often think, which is wrong, this is real. That toolbox is not big enough. I saw one that this person had. I need that one. And after a minute, I'm like, well, why can't I get that one? Man, why does he get to have that? We do, we do that, don't we? Well, why, why does everybody look at her like such a good mom? You know what I'm talking about. We do this. We do this in our minds all the time, and it will lead us to jealousy and resentment. Resentment towards others and jealousy. I'm telling you, per the Word of God, will lead you to further sin. I know it's not popular to talk about sin, but I'm going to talk about it because God's Word talks about it. These things will lead us further down the path of sin. Let me read this a little story to you. And you know this story, I think. Second, or 1 Samuel chapter 18, verses 7 through 9. This was their song. Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed his ten thousands. This made Saul very angry. Why? Because Saul was comparing himself to David. He wanted to be as great as David was. What's this, he said? They credit David with ten thousands and me with only thousands? Next they'll be making him their king, as they did. You can imagine what that did to Saul. So listen, listen to this verse. So from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. Always watching, what's David doing? How can I? Why is he better than me? Why are they saying I only did 10,000? They're saying he did hundreds. Like, why? What can I? It distracts you. You begin to resent. You get jealous that you're not what you think will make you that thing 
unless you follow that person. Here's what I would say. Scrap all that and follow this. How about that? I mean, I'm telling myself, like, I have to do this myself. I'm like, okay, that's wrong thinking, JP. Come on, get your act together. It's wrong. You're speaking about this on Sunday, JP. Come on. My third point, and like I said many times, but I need to be candid with you because the Bible's clear. Comparing yourself to others is a byproduct of your sin nature. Your sin nature likes certain things. You know, I should do this, I know the right thing to do, but man, that, that pull is really strong to do the wrong thing because I like it. Comparisons among us adds no value to the body of Christ. It reduces meaning for the body of Christ. And it robs you of fulfillment of what God has for you. God doesn't have for you what that person is doing. He has for you what he has for you. When you realize that, people can do whatever they want. You don't really care. You're like, well, God's got, I'm on God's path now. Do whatever you want. Buy an 80-foot yacht. I don't care. Just invite me. Okay, that's all I'm saying. Like, stick on the path that God has for you. If you begin to compare, you'll begin to resent and you begin to uh, get jealous. But you need to know that comparing yourselves to others is a byproduct of my sin nature and your sin nature. Galatians chapter 5. And I want to read this to you because it's very clear in Scripture. Galatians 5, 16 through 20. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your life. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants you to do. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature does. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you are not free to carry out your good intentions. If you, if you allow yourself to compare yourself with somebody else in a negative way, your sin nature is guiding you and leading you. You're doing what you're, we call it in theology, your flesh. Your sinful flesh wants to do. Instead of doing what the spirit in you wants to do. If you want to understand that concept, Romans 6, 7, and 8. All you got to do is read it. It's there. If you need explanation, I'd love to talk about that. Listen to this. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are, no, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. When you follow, you ready? When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Let me read it again, because he's telling us, if you do these things, if we compare in a negative way and leads us to jealousy and resentment, then it's our sin nature that's motivating us, and we're choosing to walk in it. When you follow the desires of your sin nature, the results are very clear. You make that person an idol. Idolatry, sorcery, hostility, maybe. Saul wanted to just off David. Outburst of anger, selfishness, ambition, dissension and division. I dare say, if you're comparing yourself to someone else and they don't know, and it's in a negative way, they're probably not your bestie. They may be, but generally speaking, you kind of keep back from a distance and you, one eye. Let me check what they're doing. Hmm. Yeah, I think I'll do that too. I, I know we do that. Like... That, that's our flesh wanting to feed this desire for us to really know who we are and who, what God has for us. And so we use the wrong thing, the wrong standard many times, right? If I was just, then I could. If I just had, then I would. Let me, let me say to you. This is not uncommon to the human. Very common thing. 
Very common. It started in Genesis chapter 3 and 4. You remember Cain and Abel? Why is God taking his sacrifice and he's not taking mine? Hmm. I worked hard. I toiled the land. I got all this fruit and everything. And nothing. But he likes, he likes Abel's sacrifice. Hmm. Cain to Abel. Hey, you want to go for a walk? That's what happens. Maybe not openly and physically, but in our minds, that happens. And, and we have to protect ourselves against this. We have to protect ourselves against this. It's all through the Bible. This concept is all through the Bible. So, the question is, how do we get out of this trap? Jesus, obviously in verse 35, gave the answer to answers. Mark chapter 9, verse 35. Listen to this. He sat down, called the twelve disciples over to him, and said, Whoever wants to be first must take last place and be the servant of everyone else. He didn't address who, but he told the disciples, and this is an overarching principle that's true for the Gospels, for Acts, for the, uh, Paul's epistles. Whoever wants to be first must take last place and be the servant of everyone else. Uh, there's a book that I read, and matter of fact, when I watched this video, I saw the book that, did you guys see the book that was sitting on his, uh, some of you don't look at those things, I look at those things. The book was titled, Leaders Eat Last. I read it, uh, humbling, not even from a biblical perspective, it's just humbling. Like when you think of yourself, like, man, if I'm going to serve somebody else, what practical things can I do, or are you that person that is, well, I can't do that because that doesn't suit me the best. Well, I want to be first in line because I don't want anybody to eat. I don't want anybody to, to get it before I get some. I mean, those are small things, right? But if, if we don't take on this heart of a servant serving others, and I'm not just talking outside the church. I'm talking in the church. And I, I'm going to put a plug in right now for every area that we have. If you're here and you're a partner with us and you're not serving, I would, I would ask you to think about that. How does God view that? How does he, how does he view you? You come to church and you get full, but that's all you do. God has some words for that stuff in here. I, I, it's not me saying it, it's him saying it. So we have to find ourselves in a place, if we want to get out of the trap of comparing ourselves with others, then Jesus says, oh, that's easy, serve each other. Be last, not first. Now, sometimes we don't remember it. Sometimes we don't think about it. Sometimes we do think about it, and we don't care. <laughs> we just want to be first. I want you to do what I want. So let me, let me give you an example here. Um, many times people will come in. I'm not, I'm not saying this is bad. I'm just saying this has happened, okay? People will say... Why don't you guys do what church does? Why don't you have like that church does? And as a pastor, like when you hear that stuff, you're like, yeah, well, maybe. And you could, we, I can slip it. True or not true, Dyke? Yeah. It's true. You could slip into, well, yeah, maybe we should do that because that's what North Point does. Maybe we should do that because that's what Elevation does. Here's what I want us to do, okay? I want us to be the church at Rives that God wants us to be, and we want to serve you. That's it. That's it. I want you to serve each other. That, like, that's what we have to do. He's asking us to do that. Yes, even the person that you don't like. Amen? That's hard. Yeah, but I don't like them. They probably don't like you either. 
Simon Sinek, like I was, as I was watching, I'm like, isn't it really weird? You think the person doesn't like you and you feel bad about yourself and you come to find out. You both think the same way and you end up becoming friends and encouraging one another and serving one another. That's the body of Christ. Amen. Not this separated shoulder to shoulder. Mm, I'm leaving. Okay. You know what? There is a reason. You ready? There's a reason why we took everything out of the foyer. You know why? Because after the service and before, we want you to stand out there and do that. We want room. I want room for you guys to stand in those. I, I love it. When I walk out there and I see all these little groups and I see the teens over there, the girls whispering and giggling at the cute little boy that walked. You know, I, I see it all. You know, I watched it. Like, we want to provide a space and a place for you to minister to one another and serve one another. There's some of you here who need encouraging. I know that. There's others in this body that should be serving them and encouraging them. But if you're running straight out the door, you might as well forget it. I got to get to the smorgasbord first or the other people at First Baptist will beat us there. You don't have to tell me. I know how it works. Because they fry their chicken right at 12. Think about this, guys. Think. Think. I have to think about this. I do. I happen to have a neighbor, one of my neighbors. Um, I, okay, so the Spirit of God was on me the other day, like, doing, like, had his thumb on me. I drove up my road and my neighbor was cutting grass. I wound down my window. I waved. He kept going right on past me. You know what my first thought was? I'm not talking to him again. You see what I'm saying? See how that works? I don't, why should I serve him? He's not even friendly to me. And the Holy Spirit was like, oh man, it was heavy. I was like, I told Sue about it and she's like, yeah, and of course Sue waves to the telephone poles. You know, it's like we go by and she's like, oh, is that a person? You know, I'm like, no, babe, that's a telephone pole. Don't, don't wave at that. Um, she's just friendly. She talks to everybody. I'm not. I mean, I just am different, you know. But this thing, if we allow it to grow in us, okay, if we allow it to grow in us, and we understand what the Spirit of God wants. You will stop comparing yourselves with others and being or wanting to be what God has made them. And if you serve others, you will actually become the person that God wants you to be. And you will not compare yourself to one and each other. Why? Because you're not thinking about that. You're thinking about serving Jesus. All your, you guys are arguing about who's going to be first. Hmm, okay, well, why don't you serve one another? That's who's going to be first. True to Jesus' form. At the end of that chapter, and there's a couple of verses, and he says this. He gave an example. He says, and then he called a child over to him, and he had him sit on his lap. And he says, if you want to be first in the kingdom, you will do exactly what I just showed you with his child. Now, that's not always easy, right? Time, work. I can't. I just can't. I get it. But there's an example that we can follow here that God gives us, which um, in, in all honesty, um, the end of it, the end of it says this, you have to have the same attitude in verse uh, 37. He says, you have to have the same attitude that Christ has. Okay, and if, and if I was to give you a, more of a study on that, I would say, well, in Isaiah, it says that he bore our shame, griefs, sorrows. He became the servant of all and to all. And they mistreated him. They beat him. They laughed at him and mocked him. And he didn't even open his mouth, but he still did what he did. He still served us. He served you and I on the cross by dying for our sins. Amen. I don't think it's that big of a deal to work 15 minutes or 20 minutes in the coffee shop once a month. I mean, if you're going to compare, or in our kids, or in the youth group. 
in conclusion, you need to know this. You imperfect disciples, you and I, we do not have to be perfect to serve. We just have to be willing. That's it. Well, I wasn't called to serve. That's fine, but there's nothing wrong with volunteering. <laughs> right? Well, God didn't call me to that. That's okay. Volunteer anyway. Don't hide behind that stuff, okay? I, I, I do this. I know. I mean, we have to, have to keep our minds straight when it comes to, to this stuff. Let's, let's pray together. Father, we're grateful for who you are.